Uh, welcome, and, and a special thanks to the Board of the Energy Club for organizing this event with an with, uh, with impressive lineup, I must uh, say, of speakers. Um, and I was reading through the board's backgrounds and, and what they are studying, and I was quite impressed. And, and if all of you, all of you listeners and, and all of you watching this um, morning uh, have a similar background, then you're already quite well informed about energy, energy transition. So I think we can have a, a high level uh, discussion this morning. So that's, that's good. And for me, it's, it's quite an honor to be here. I, I, actually, I wanted to uh, study in Delft when I uh, finished school, but my math grades weren't high enough for that. Um, and although I had a very good time in Wageningen, it's always uh, strange to go to Delft and say, okay, I would have liked to be here. But being chairing this meeting today, well, that gives me some uh, positive feelings about that. Um, let me uh, introduce myself. I, as I said, I've studied in Wageningen. I studied environmental uh, studies, and I've been very happy with that study also. And at that time, uh, environment, well, I'd, they probably heard of it in Delft, but, but it wasn't... Uh, integrated in any study uh, at that time. So, so it was better for me to go to Wageningen at the end. Um, and I've worked in that field uh, of the environment for the rest of my life, which is funny because when I started studying, uh, everyone said, okay, what can you do when you have done uh, environmental studies? But when I finished uh, my studies in Wageningen, we had the acid rain problem and already climate issue was rising. And I've worked in this field and, and, and many different uh, jobs uh, since then. Um, currently, I work for EBN. And EBN is a publicly owned energy company. And originally, uh, EBN was only active in the oil and gas uh, business, um, making sure by participating in oil and gas um, uh, production fields that enough money of that uh, activity came back to the Dutch um, uh, politics system, economy. Um, but now, uh, being responsible for, for a large part of that energy and uh, gas and oil system, uh, EBN also is very active in the transition of the system towards a totally renewable system. And that's also why I joined two years ago, or almost two years ago, um, because I have been active in climate issues, energy is, issues for a long time, uh, and I'm now helping within EBN to give EBN a role in the transition of the total energy system. Um, today, we talk about the scale-ups uh, and the role of scale-ups in the Green Deal, in the transition. And I don't know what, what Dieter Samson is going to say about that, uh, later on, but I'm convinced that they are crucial uh, because we need much more innovations. We are now solving the climate problem with, with old school technologies, actually, and I think there's a lot of potential in innovation uh, still, and we're going to need that. Maybe not in the next 10 to 15 years because it takes time for innovations to really be successful on the market, but in the long run, uh, if you, especially if you look what, what, what's going to happen worldwide, with, with still a growing uh, population, then we will need real new technologies and new insights on how to solve the, the energy uh, uh, issue. Um, it, that is especially important because our current energy system, <coughs> as some of you have already know probably, is relatively simple. Um, we have large-scale energy production, uh, distributed usage, and there's hardly any interaction between the different energy carriers. Uh, so the electric electricity system is totally separated from the gas system or the system we have to fuel our cars and trucks, etc. cetera. Um, but the new system is going to be much more integrated. Um, it will be more integrated in, with more interaction between those different value chains, the gases and the electricity. Um, 
but also the production is no longer centralized. It is decentralized and it is no longer that large scale. And it's also, especially renewable energy, looking at the windmills behind me, uh, it is not dispatchable. So the system will become much more uh, complicated. And the transition to such a more integrated system is not simple. The large incumbent companies, uh, Shell, Exxon, uh, large uh, power production companies, uh, they have a lot of vested interests in the current system. And although they are convinced that they will have to change and they really believe the climate issue is a big uh, problem, um, they're also afraid of their shareholder value. But as I always say, a transition is not something for frightened people. You have to be courageous to enter into the, this uh, uh, transition. Um, and you have to be willing to work together in, in new alliances. We're not used to that. It is very regulated, regulated the, the current energy system, but we're going to have to build new alliances and we're going to have to trust each other more than we do now. And so the transition is not only a technical issue, but it's also a social issue. Um, I, I myself, I'm working on building those new alliances in a, in a few aspects of the energy system. And those aspects are especially focused on um, looking at ways to, to bring the natural gas usage down and in the process, uh, making sure that the climate impact of the remaining usage of gas is, is limited to a large extent. Things I'm active in, for instance, are, and that's not a very sexy subject, but it's important, um, carbon capture and storage, CCS, as they call it. And there's a lot of opposition towards uh, CCS uh, because it's seen as, okay, and then we are still needed using the fossil fuels and, and why uh, use those, why not speed up the usage of, of uh, renewable sources? But um, in a lot of scenarios, it's clear that even if we do our utmost to build up uh, the production of renewable energy, we're going, still going to use fossil fuels for a long time. And we, the, the climate problem just can't have all that time of emissions of, uh, uh, due to the usage of fossil fuels. So that's why um, I'm convinced, and a lot of people are convinced that we're gonna need carbon capture and storage. And that's quite a difficult, and, and I was talking about new alliances, that means that we need to make sure that in industry, the ca capture takes place, that the CO2 infrastructure is built, and that in the, the, the gas fields that are no longer uh, used for gas, uh, winning new gas, that they are rebuilt to make sure that they can store uh, gas there. And we all have to orchestrate this at the same time. And that needs that uh, working together, building those alliances. Another field uh, we are active in is the hydrogen uh, uh, field. And, uh, well, uh, there's a lot of talk about hydrogen, and I think hydrogen is going to be uh, a major uh, player in our future energy system. Um, but it's not a silver bullet. And, and sometimes people forget that hydrogen is not an energy source. It's an energy carrier. It's comparable to electricity, and it has to be made, and it can only be made through other uh, electricity or energy sources. And so we are working on green hydrogen uh, out of uh, renewable electricity. But as you've probably heard, um, there's not enough renewable electricity yet to, to make a lot of green hydrogen out of that. So if we now um, produce a lot of electrolyzers and produce a lot of hydrogen with that, it's, it's going to be great because uh, it, the, the energy, the, the electricity usage will increase and that will be fossil-based electricity. So we have to uh, 
uh, build up experience with electrolyzers and uh, green uh, hydrogen production. And we have to speed up to a large extent uh, the production of renewable energy. Um, but we have to take into account uh, that, that in the beginning, it will actually be gray uh, hydrogen. So that is where CCS carbon capture comes in again, because we can also uh, produce hydrogen out of uh, natural gas um, and then capturing the CO2 and uh, storing it. So then you have a climate neutral hydrogen. You can help build up the whole hydrogen system, uh, the hydrogen infrastructure, the hydrogen usage by different players. Um, but um, uh, and then when you have enough renewable energy, you can um, uh, switch over to uh, to green uh, hydrogen, which is a good thing. Um, so that are the kinds of things I'm working on. Also on green gas, uh, geothermal energy, which has the same kind of problem that you have a lot of geothermal energy, but you have to build up the, the production of the geothermal energy, but also the distribution of the heat and the usage of the heat. And, and that has to be orchestrated, that process. And um, I cannot emphasize that enough that you have to be realize how difficult that is to orchestrate all these processes together. We're not used to that. And so uh, sometimes I say to my colleagues, we have to uh, hold each other's hand in those alliances because it's a new future. We're not sure how it will work, uh, but we have to be prepared to investigate that together with each other. Um, well, <clears throat> as I said, uh, today we are talking about startups. And, and I was very um, impressed by the three startups we have today uh, in the meeting. Um, and I'm very happy to introduce them later on. Um, we will uh, have three startups, all three uh, talking for about 15 minutes. I hope they will stick to the time. Otherwise, I'll tell them to. Um, and if you have any questions, please post them in the chat because after these three uh, presentations, we will uh, have a Q and A and we will go into the chat and uh, post some of those questions to the, the presenters, the, the three presenters we have. After that, after the Q and A, we will have a, small, a short break and then we will uh, uh, convene again and uh, Dietrich Samson will join us for his uh, presentation. But for now, I'm very uh, happy and, and Proud to present the first speaker, which is uh, Adriano Desideri. I don't know if I pronounce that correctly, of uh, Solo. And um, he's, uh, he's also working on the, the power systems for greenhouse uh, farms. So I'm very interested to hear from him. Adriano, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks a lot for um, your introduction. The pronunciation was uh, indeed uh, correct. Um, hello everyone, I'll try to share my screen. Uh, let's see. Uh, do you guys uh, see it? Do you guys see the presentation? Yeah, okay, cool. <clears throat> so, um, well, it's an honor and a pleasure to be, to be here. Um, I am the CEO and co-founder of Solo. We are uh, a company based in, uh, in Delft. Uh, the Yes Delft uh, incubator, um, developing a solar-based energy system to power um, greenhouse farms. So uh, um, our mission is to enable the transition towards sustainable food provision. And what we have developed is a, is a system that uses the sun as an input to generate uh, heating and cooling uh, to power greenhouse, greenhouse farms. So we all know that the global population is going uh, to rise to 9 billion people and agriculture will have to double food production uh, with fewer resources and lower environmental impact. Now, greenhouse farms are a proven solution to sustainably intensify the production of uh, fresh produce, mainly because they dramatically decrease the amount of uh, water consumption per kilogram of produce. 
Um, so uh, Europe is leading the greenhouse uh, industry and greenhouse manufacturers are our, are our main customers. We have spent many hours discussing with them in the past, uh, in the past years and uh, together with them we have identified the three main challenges. So uh, the greenhouse farms is an extremely energy intensive industry. It emits 15 million tons of CO2 per year in Europe. Um, furthermore, um, it, and so it requires a solid energy infrastructure. And what happens is that in most regions outside Europe, mainly North Africa, Middle East, Southeast Asia, where these greenhouse farms are most needed, there is no energy infrastructure that can cover the energy demand of these, uh, of these systems. So uh, based on these, um, on these discussions, we came up with uh, a system which is called uh, the, which we call the Sprout, that uses solar energy to generate heating and cooling for a greenhouse farm. So here you see a schematic of it. We use a flat plate solar thermal collector. So it's not photovoltaic, it's uh, so solar thermal. We heat up water up to 90 degrees C. We store it in a thermal storage. And then from there, we um, either directly go to the greenhouse farm or we pass through a thermal driven chiller for cooling purposes. Um, so. We use uh, uh, state-of-the-art commercially available uh, um, technologies. What we have developed is all the hardware and software solution required to safely and uh, automatically operating this type of large, of large systems. Um, here's the first facility we have built in, uh, in the south of France, together with one of the largest uh, Dutch greenhouse manufacturers. Um, the system has been in operation for 1.5 years um, with a lot of ups and downs, and as you can imagine, as it was our first, uh, our first system. And uh, we, are finally, uh, we, finally managed to have, we finally managed to have the system operated completely autonom in a completely autonomous way from our offices, in, and we can control and monitor everything from our offices in Delft. And so, um, we are finally um, scaling up to deploy a first commercial system in, um, in Italy um, next year, um, which will uh, generate uh, heating and uh, some cooling slash dehumidification for, for the greenhouse farm. Um, so the system will be most probably developed in, in Tuscany um, next year, and we are, we, are, um, we, are, we are proud that we finally managed to, to uh, uh, come to a first uh, commercial commercial system. Um, so um, our system, so let's say, for uh, our system is uh, is in line uh, with with some of the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals, in particular zero hunger, affordable and clean energy, and uh, responsible consumption and production. Um, here I've added uh, just a number to show how energy intensive, how polluted uh, the, uh, uh, a greenhouse farm uh, could be. So a five hectare greenhouse farm consume up to 4,500 tons per year of, emits up to 4,500 tons per year of CO2 uh, equivalent. And uh, so we are working to, to lower that, uh, that number. Um, so just uh, an overview of, um, what uh, we have been uh, uh, doing in um, in the past years. So, as all the startups, we um, we start. So, we started in 2017, and then as all the startups, we won a lot of of, um, of prizes and um, and uh, subsidies to to start with. Uh, in 2019, we deployed uh, our uh, first uh, system that you saw before in the south of France. Um, and this was in collaboration with Van der Ruben. That was really our, our kickoff, basically. So they, the collaboration with them allowed uh, us to um, enter a lot of uh, discussions with, uh, with other players because we, we gained a lot of, of credibility. And um, this year we managed to uh, have a system, let's say, up and running uh, uh, based on uh, industrial standards. Um, we plan next year to deploy a first facility in, um, in, in Italy and then to scale uh, mainly in, uh, in, the min in North Africa and, uh, and Middle East. We are currently discussing uh, with, um, with companies in, um, indeed in, uh, in Cairo, in, uh, in Saudi, in the Emirates, 
and also in uh, South Korea. So CAPCO is the largest, it's actually the only energy provider of South Korea. And uh, in South Korea, they have a big uh, problem with, in, with their uh, <coughs> horticultural industry as uh, it is based on very outdated uh, system, which requires a lot of manpower. The population that is, that is living in the countryside is getting older. The young people don't want to go uh, to, uh, let's say, to grow their vegetables in the countryside anymore. And so they are looking into ways of, uh, of uh, reducing uh, the um, demand labor in the, in the countryside, while at the same time also keep, keeping a low energy consumption. And so with that, together with Cap Capco, we are discussing about setting up uh, a first facility, a first, let's say, 100% renewable based greenhouse farm. Um, so here you see a bit uh, um, an overview of uh, the systems we are discussing. So uh, the blue dots are the ones that are in progress. Um, in, uh, in Europe, we are mainly active in the south, in south of Europe, mainly for uh, a, a, say a weather a reason. So our system is based on on sun and um, and so there is simply much more sun in the south than it there is here uh, that makes our our case economically economically viable. Another issue why this system could not really be applied in the Netherlands is the fact that the greenhouse industry in the Netherlands is um, is is organized in clusters of greenhouses. So you have, uh, you don't have space available. The land is uh, super expensive and uh, natural gas is simply too cheap to compete with. There is um, a gas network, which is extremely well developed and people have invested in combined heat and power unit. So at the moment it's kind of impossible to compete against, uh, against um, CHP. On, that, on the positive side, uh, the, the Parliament of the Netherlands just introduced, uh, uh, just voted for a carbon uh, tax. So maybe things will change in the coming, um, in the, in the coming, uh, in the coming future. And uh, it's also true that I mean, um, the 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 energy, let's say, uh, the energy system will be based on a combination of technologies and uh, for in the Netherlands I see geothermal energy as a much better solution compared to, to our to our system. Um, so just a couple of more slides for me. Um, so this is our our team. We are still uh, a relatively small team. It's me and Emiliano, the other co-founder who is also Italian, is based in Zurich. Um, and we, together we funded the, the company in 2017 really to put our studies into practice and do something uh, concrete with what we have learned in the, in, at the university. We both studied at uh, TU Delft actually and now is in at ETH in Zurich. And then uh, in 2019, Claire and Simon joined us to support uh, our developments and uh, we are now finalizing uh, our our um, investment round and uh, looking to scale next uh, next year with the first system and uh, i think i have still plenty of time but i'd like to conclude by stating our vision and with a small uh, 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 brief um, uh, reflection so um we uh, so we are at Solo. We are working towards a world where where fresh produce is grown wherever people need, in an environmentally sustainable way, overcoming water scarcity and uh, and climate change. So we live in an extremely industrialized uh, society uh, that is based on burning uh, fossil fuels. So it's basically b based on shifty, shifting the production cost of anything we consume into the environment in the form of CO2. So we are, we are now slightly, uh, slowly realizing that this is not sustainable in the long term and that we need a shift towards a uh, renewable based uh, solution. Um, the reality is that at the moment uh, uh, it's extremely difficult to compete with a very well established uh, fossil fuel based uh, energy, energy system. And so uh, I think and that a very good way, a very good incentives to transition towards a renewable based uh, uh, solution is by introducing a carbon tax now, uh, which basically um, 
uh, is a fee on uh, the um, um, on uh, on uh, on 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 burning uh, uh, fossil fuels, so on on releasing CO two into the environment. Now, some countries in the world have already adopted this kind of tax. Uh, the Netherlands just did so recently. It will go into uh, action next uh, next year. Um, but there is still a lot a lot to do, uh, especially at uh, at the European level. And so, I would like to conclude by presenting you this, ni this nice uh, initiative, which is called the StopGlobalWarming.eu, uh, which, uh, which is an idea introduced by uh, around 27 Nobel laureates. Um, it's uh, a very nice... Uh, so you can go to the website, it's a petition where you can sign to uh, um, uh, tell the European Commission to uh, submit a, a legal act on on uh, on, a uh, on a carbon tax. So the nice thing is that we live in a, in a democratic uh, society, and so you can exercise your power of uh, a democratic citizen by signing this uh, uh, this petition and and um, and and uh, push, let's say, the um, uh, the institutions to uh, to do something more concrete uh, towards, a, uh, towards a world where uh, we will be fossil fuel free. Uh, so thanks a lot. And um, yeah, that, this was my, this was it. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Adriano. Quite impressive. I, I worked in the greenhouse sector myself for some time. And the interesting thing I've, I see is that 30 years ago, greenhouses in the Netherlands were seen as something that was not sustainable at all. Why don't we grow these uh, products somewhere else where there's enough sun? But as you correctly say, the, the whole concept, uh, looking at the growing uh, population of the world, uh, is becoming more interesting uh, all the time. I'm really curious, but we'll have that in the Q&A later on, happens with overheating because the regions you're talking about have a lot of sun and I know that can also be a problem but yeah. let's not go into that uh, at this moment um, we're right on schedule so that's great and uh, I'd now like to uh, introduce Willem Kesselo from UPJ uh, working on uh, glass solar panels um, which is of course also a very good uh, way of producing uh, energy and as I just said producing more renewable energy is one of the key um, issues in solving the climate uh, problem, problem at the moment so uh, William the floor is yours. Thank you very much Hans let me see if the sharing works can everybody see the blue fizzy all right thanks again Hans for the introduction and welcome everybody good morning very honored to be here uh, I studied in Delft, I studied physics, and I was actually involved with the Energy Club during my studies. So I'm happy to, uh, in this way, stay connected to the community. Uh, and I'm very excited to share a bit on my vision on sustainability and the future of energy. As our company name is already suggesting intuitively, it's a combination of physics and seeing, um, which is also what drove me to study physics, because in my understanding with physics, we try to simplify complex problems. Um, so as a sort of, I want to say, thought experiment, um, I want to do a little uh, exercise with all of you. Our beautiful planet Earth, way too complex to discuss in 15 minutes. So let's also try and make it as simple as possible before I present uh, our solution towards it. Um, so the first one is the history of our planet. It's, uh, let's, let's combine it or compress it into one year. So the entire Earth has been around for one year and it's now exactly New Year's Eve, midnight, 12 o'clock. Um, the festive holidays are coming up, so I'm sure you can relate. And in that model, life on Earth was until October only bacterial. So the entire history of Earth in one year, until October, it was only bacterial. The dinosaurs only went extinct a few days ago, on the 25th of December. And we humans only arrived on stage one hour ago, so 11 p.m. 
only two minutes ago, we invented agriculture. So two minutes before midnight and only 30 seconds ago, which is maybe your last sip of champagne, we started to use fossil fuels. And now to conclude this summary, in the next 30 seconds, we will run out of it. So disregarding the whole climate heating or, or climate change political debate, sort of from a very simple physics perspective, we're using more fossil fuels than we are replenishing. So by definition, we will run out of them. Uh, and quite shortly, uh, if you look at the entire history of our planet. So thankfully, there is a, an alternative source of energy. It's a huge nuclear fusion reactor. We call it the sun. Um, and I think there is the great opportunity for us to get rid of our addiction to fossil fuel uh, and really, yeah, let's say, replace it with something more sustainable. A very simple, again, uh, model I like to use on this problem is uh, from the Dutch. It's called the Trias Energetica, which basically said, if you look at the energy problem, you only need to take into account three things. First and foremost, the most sustainable way of energy is energy saved. Uh, it's quite obvious, but it's usually forgotten. Uh, and then, so you need to save as much energy as you can. And then all the energy you still need, let's try to generate that as renewably as possible. So either with sun or solar, anything that you don't use the fuel itself. And then to sort of close the gap, they say, yeah, you can still compensate whatever is left with fossil fuels. Um, as of course, we're talking about the future. I would like to challenge ourselves to not compensate, but innovate. Yeah, so why not? really only focus on making it work with step one and step two. That's at least our passion at Fizi, and we really believe it's possible from a technology perspective. Um, so with that in mind, I'm very excited to share with you how we are aiming and trying to contribute to this challenge. So at Fizi, we started with buildings. Uh, and why? It's because we spend 90, so 90% of our time inside buildings, which makes them responsible for 40% of our global energy consumption. Um, and then again, trying to simplify this complex problem, if you think about it, all the energy losses of a building go out through the facade. So either heat or cold, it needs to go out somewhere. Uh, and then it has to go out through the facade. And then looking at energy, it will go out through the least insulating parts of your facade. So it's a very intuitive model, but it basically says all the heat or cold losses go out the window. And that's actually the analogy that we use. So we say, if you look at energy efficiency improvements of this huge problem that buildings are causing, really zoom in in the root cause, which in our view are our windows. So what we also did was when acknowledging this challenge, we said, well, windows, there's also a big opportunity because they are the only surface element of a building that are both in contact with the inside and outside environment of your building. So it's sort of a membrane for your building which got us thinking on the analogy of uh, the human skin. So us humans, we are also an energy uh, problem, so to speak. And uh, our skin is actually great at keeping a very healthy and constant indoor climate of around 37 degrees and doing so with the least amount of energy required. So it's a very decentralized way. Your skin knows when to goosebump or when to sweat. And it's not the same everywhere. So if your hand is cold, you might get goosebumps. But if your feet are warm, you might have sweaty feet. And it can be at the same time. And it goes quite autonomously. Uh, so we try to take these lessons and put them into our modeling of buildings. So we built uh, an online parametric algorithmic software tool where we really concretize the problem. So any architect or developer or homeowner can give us their uh, drawings of their, their building or apartment complex. And what we do, we make a digital twin out of it and we simulate one year. 
based on the location and the, the surrounding elements of maybe other buildings that are acting like shades or those types of things are all taken into account. And from it, we can give a smart skin composition. Now then, what is smart skin? Smart skin is really our building version of the human skin. So what we do is we activate the facade, as we call it. So we are able by integrating solar and sensor technology inside the window. So it's usually a double or a triple paint window. And inside the window, along the edges, we have our sort of patented solar and sensor technologies incorporated. And by doing so, we are able to more proactively control whatever goes on in the heat exchange in the membrane of your building. So again, going back to the losses of buildings, they all go out through the facade. And our smart skin really allows us to tackle whatever is happening proactively. So a comparison I want to make is how it's done currently. So if you are currently, let's say, in a south facing part of a building and the sun is hitting your windows, what happens is that room will slowly heat up. So the entire volume of the room slowly heats up, heats up, heats up until a thermostat somewhere notices, hey, wait a minute, it's too warm. And then the air conditioning is turned on and all the heat is again pushed out of that same window again. So there's a huge heat flux of heat first coming in, heating up the room, and then the air conditioning pushing that heat back out again. And that's very energy inefficient, uh, where our smart skin, what it does, it knows, hey, the sun is hitting uh, our windows. Yesterday, when that happened, uh, there was a heat buildup. So you know what, let's already now, with the power we produced, lower the sun blinds and send the signal to the AC there's heat coming. And by in that sense, avoiding the entire heat flux of occurring, we can save currently up to 30% of the energy efficiency of buildings. Um, and this is not only in theory, we're very proud that we have already installed over 7,000 square meters of smart skin, where we for both uh, office buildings and residential buildings and both renovation and construction are continuously proving and improving this value proposition. Um, so that's sort of how we are trying to save first as much energy as we can. But then, yeah, we also want to add to the second part of the Trias Energetica, because if you look at buildings for them to become energy neutral, you need to indeed reduce consumption as much as possible, but the rest you need to produce sustainably or renewably. And for that, we're uh, also developing technologies that we can add to our smart skin proposition. Uh, it's called a luminescent solar concentrator. It's from the uh, master thesis project from both my co-founder and myself, where we figured out that currently for windows to have their insulative value, they reflect 30% of the incoming energy from the sun. That's why you don't get sunburned when you're behind glass, for instance. So it reflects a lot of the UV and visible light for it to be an um, HR++ or insulated glass unit. What we say is that that 30% of energy, which is currently reflected, is a waste. So it's quite a shame that it's uh, simply reflected. So what we developed is a coating which does not reflect this 30%, but it absorbs it, quite similar to how a glow in the dark star absorbs light. And then instead of reflecting it, it re-emits it to the sides of your window. And because we have our solar cell and sensor technologies incorporated in the sides, this newly emitted light can there be converted into electricity. So then you don't only have an energy saving smart skin, but you also have an, in addition, energy producing smart skin. So we call this, like I said, a luminescent solar concentrator. We have about four models uh, currently in development. One is really for the European market where we apply our coating uh, on the, the, the outside pane. The other one is more for the warmer climates where there's usually laminated glass. So there the coating is in between the first pane. 
and we have yeah let's say different physical uh, properties of the coating where we can play around with how much electricity do we produce versus how much uh, energy do we want to avoid from entering in the building uh, we develop these coatings still in our lab at the, the physics faculty um, we can play around a lot with different types of uv exposure to see how much of the energy we can actually capture at the edges and we are installing them already in real life. So what you see here is a pilot project in, uh, in Spain. And we're going to install the, the building on the right, so the big facade, in June next year. So that we can actually monitor how much electricity produced in addition to how much energy we save. Um, and I thought I saw, of course, the other presentation. A, a nice example from us in innovation is that by developing these light conversion coatings uh, we also stumbled upon uh, adjacent uh, technology which is quite interesting for the greenhouses uh, mentioned before so we are able to capture and convert light which we can use to produce electricity but a very cool application is that we're also able to provide the coating on a greenhouse which converts uv light into visible light and not sense it to the edges, but really directly sense it inside the greenhouse. So this is an open invitation uh, that this might be in addition to the, the sprout proposition of our previous presentation to add to the crop yields uh, to also help there in the yeah, UN development goals. Uh, but let's talk about this maybe later. Um, this is actually a bit what I wanted to share as concluding remark towards why we find it so important to work on these things and why instruments such as the Green Deal are so important. And that's basically because what you see here is untrue. So the real road towards any value of these developments is very messy. Uh, you have a feeling you're walking backwards uh, half the time. If I look at us, we really started anti-squatting. The, the picture on the bottom left, there was no heating when writing our first business plan. Uh, we partook in as many startup competitions as possible to get funded. So that was really our way of remaining uh, financially healthy. Uh, but even so, we had a lot of setbacks. This was actually our very first generation smart skin sold to our very first client, uh, which on transporting day, so it was the day we were finally going to able to install it, uh, broke which was sort of four months of blood, sweat and tears uh, wasted, unfortunately. Uh, we had to pivot a lot, um, have to a lot of additions and really listening to the market on what is now actually the problem we're solving. Uh, it's definitely not a straight line in these types of yeah, hardware and deep technical innovations. Uh, but we're, we're getting there and I think it's a long journey. We're already in business for six and a half years um, we are slowly moving outside the lab into our own um, yeah let's say high-tech assembly lines we call it the fizzy factory it's sort of a creative place where we can really build our products um, and as said I'm, I'm afraid your time is up so yeah, Maybe this is a, speed up, uh, a little. last two slides. Uh, very proud that outside the factory, we are actually installing it in the field, um, which concludes the, the journey we're on. Um, and even this is, we have no idea where we are now. It's very hard to determine where exactly you are. Only when looking back, you can see maybe a trend. Uh, and that's why I wanted to make a case for these types of developments uh, that can help bring us closer to the, a sustainable planet. In the end, uh, we like to say it's all about the people, but for it, we need the funding. So a big, big um, shout out from all of us at Fizi to all of you. If you have any ways of helping us, either by contributing from governmental instruments all the way until uh, internships or uh, job applications. We're more than uh, happy to continue this conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Willem. It was a very, very nice uh, talk. And I have a lot of uh, questions about that, especially also the last uh, slide showing this that kind of a dragon. Um, I was wondering what that meant, but uh, maybe we'll see uh, later. Nice. Okay, so thanks a lot.
And uh, now let's uh, move ahead to, um, is it Michael or Michael? I'm not sure. It's, but, uh, uh, it's Michael. Uh, Michael. So <laughs> welcome, Michael. And uh, from Vertoro, uh, working on uh, bio-based alternatives for fossil resources. Um, very interested to hear from you. Uh, Michael, the floor is yours. Okay, share my screen. So our product is called Goldilocks. Uh, Goldilocks is a new type of oil. Uh, and we like to say it's oil done just right. Uh, just like the Goldilocks fairy tale, not too big, not too small, not too hard, not too soft, but just right. That's how we see our oil. Uh, in the intro uh, by Hans, he, he mentioned that we're working on bio-based alternatives uh, to fossil resources. But my first slide is actually that not all fossil resources are bad. Uh, a lot of, we're always trained in, in pitches to start with the problem, huh? but we're, we're optimists. We always start with what's not the problem. What's not the problem are the trillions in legacy assets uh, that, uh, that constitute the fossil world. Uh, talking about oil refineries, petrochemical plants, uh, ship, ship engines. Uh, when we see like commercials from Greenpeace, uh, for instance, talking about global warming, we always see these oil refineries belching out these these white clouds uh, as if uh, the steel was the problem. Uh, the steel is not the problem. What is the problem it is what's going into these assets today. Uh, that's the problem. Uh, so the, the fossil resources uh, in terms of coal, uh, natural gas, uh, fossil oil that are going into uh, oil refineries, petrochemical plants, and, and engines, uh, that's in fact uh, the problem. And that's the problem we want to solve. Um, so talking about energy transition, as far as we're concerned, has nothing to do with tearing down everything uh, that the fossil world has built up painstakingly over the 150 years. In fact, we see the biggest way to realize a fossil transition is to make a connect to that fossil world as upstream possible as possible in the value chain. So if we're talking about more sustainable inputs for these uh, oil refineries or, or petrochemical plants, um, we don't have to look far. There are more sustainable inputs that are abundantly available. Uh, think of sawdust, agricultural waste. Uh, in fact, uh, there is a lot more residual discarded biomass that we cannot eat uh, ourselves. Uh, so non-edible discarded biomass produced globally, then we pump fossil oil out of the ground. Uh, so we don't have to look far. It's not expensive. It's produced everywhere around the world. Uh, but the only problem is uh, it doesn't really flow through pipes. And the fossil world has been designed around liquids. If you think about tanker trucks, uh, oil tankers, pipes, refineries, petrochemical plants, everything is fed uh, with the liquid inputs. And as you can see here, these are not liquid inputs. So here's where we come in as for Toro. My background is mechanical engineering. So I try to think uh, in, in very simple ways of uh, very simple solutions, uh, WD-40 and, and duct tape uh, type of solutions. Very straightforward. So there is abundantly available, cheap, non-edible carbon on the one side in the bio-based world. And then on the fossil world, we have perfectly uh, suited steel in the form of oil refineries, ship engines, petrochemical plants, etc., screaming uh, for a more sustainable source of carbon. But that carbon source has to be liquid. And on the bio-based side, it is solid. So what do we do? As for Toro, we convert solids into liquids. And that is the only thing that we do. If we talk about uh, our technology, uh, at least the way I try to explain it to myself is that it's like making coffee. Uh, the technology itself is based on thermal sulfolysis, like coffee making. So I made a small table here to explain the differences as we all uh, comprehend the idea of, of making coffee. Uh, so what do we put in our coffee machine? We put a solvent, 
uh, normally this is water. In our case, it's a sustainable polar organic solvent, which sounds complicated, but it could be methanol or ethanol, which we all recognize. Uh, and in the feedstock, so what uh, we put in our coffee machine as a, as a solid, uh, those are typically coffee beans. Uh, and in our case, we use non-edible discarded biomass, which could be spent coffee, so the coffee waste, but also agricultural waste, uh, sawdust, uh, and a lot of uh, waste wood from, from forest management. And then we turn the machine on. Uh, so what does a coffee machine do? It applies uh, pressure and heat uh, and allows for some residence time such that the solvent and feedstock can react. Uh, and what happens, uh, albeit in our case at a bit higher temperature, is that part of the biomass goes into the solvent. In uh, the coffee, it's the good part, uh, the part uh, that, that we like, that we're addicted to, things like caffeine. And in our case, it's the lignin part of biomass. So lignin uh, constitutes about 25% of all terrestrial biomass, so biomass that grows on land. Uh, I could give lectures, and I actually do, about the evolutionary history of lignin and why it's such a wonderful molecule. Um, but we'll just leave it at, at lignin uh, for here. So we call our Goldilocks oil or the Goldilocks oils comprise essentially of this lignin part of biomass dissolved in methanol or ethanol, for instance. And this is our oil product. Uh, of course, uh, there's not a 100% conversion, as is the case in espresso making. You have uh, some waste, uh, and uh, in the case of espresso, it's coffee grounds, which for us is actually an input. Uh, we've taken waste streams from, from Dawa experts, for instance, and taken it as a feedstock for our process and, and made oil. Uh, but our byproduct uh, is cellulose, and cellulose is not a waste at all. There's billions of tons of cellulose uh, converted uh, in, into paper, cellulosic ethanol, uh, and other high-value components. If we look at the projects uh, that we're running, it's very mixed. We tend to think uh, in a value pyramid approach. And this sounds very innovative, but it's in fact what the, all oil majors have been doing for decades. Uh, if you t think about a barrel of oil, what most people don't realize is that only about 8%, or let's call it 10%, uh, goes to non-energy products like chemicals and materials. The other 90% of a barrel of oil goes into the energy market. Gasoline alone is 40% of a barrel of oil. I'm often asked, uh, because we do energy products, I'll, I'll say something about that uh, later on, uh, why we do energy. Why not only go to carbon fibers or, uh, or other high value applications? Why would you also do low, val uh, low value things like, like biomass? And then I always say, you need uh, the economy of the uh, economy of scale of the energy market, uh, which is enormous, in order to big big refineries uh, and at big refineries operating at economy of scale, you can afford uh, at, to do it in a profitable way to put this ten percent uh, in, into a high value. And if it made sense uh, for a company like Shell to do only high value uh, or Exxon uh, to do only chemicals, which are a lot more profitable than uh, than gasoline, for instance, you have to assume that they would have figured that out by now and done it. In fact, the most profitable way uh, to refine a barrel of oil is to do almost exclusively energy and only a small fraction into, into high value. Uh, and this split is also uh, would be basically copy pasted from, from big oil. And we have a number of uh, EU projects uh, working on automotive and jet fuels, for instance, but also one working on marine fuel. Then people ask, why are you doing marine fuel? And the simple answer is that a ship engine uh, of a container ship, for instance, can digest bitumen-like fuels. And if you look uh, at the beginning of our presentation where I mentioned that biomass is solid, it's a lot easier to hit, chemically speaking, a bitumen-like uh, viscosity or, or grade than it is to make something so liquid as, as jet fuel or gasoline. And then the kicker is, uh, due to recent sulfur legislation, um, these ship engines that normally sail on sulfur-laden bitumen now are forced to sail on more or less automotive diesel, which means that a company like Maersk is paying as much 
for their fuel as somebody driving a BMW. But uh, talking uh, about biomass conversion, it's a lot cheaper to produce something that could be digested by a ship engine than something that could be di digested by a BMW engine, which is why we have a strong focus in the energy part, at least um, on the shipping sector, because it's so profitable. It's very easy to hit something the ship can digest and they're paying automotive like, like prices. We also have projects in the, uh, in the chemicals and material space, uh, base chemicals like phenol and also materials like polyurethane. So the seat cushion you're sitting on, or I presume we're sitting on seat cushions uh, is polyurethane, for instance, but also the insulation materials in buildings. We also have a project uh, to replace bitumen, fossil-based bitumen and, and asphalt. And then we have a very large uh, EU flagship project that we submitted and is pending and we very much hope it will be granted that we go into specialties like sunscreen lotion where our lignin is in fact a UV stabilizer but also battery cathodes. Uh, if we look at the composition of our team, uh, so it's uh, myself and Panos Kuris as, uh, as founders, we have an academic background and I also have a background uh, as a serial entrepreneur for the past 15 years, uh, sports cars, yachts, the turbos, fuels, uh, very broad. Uh, we decided it best also to bring in talent from, from multinationals. So our CFO is from Aramco, large, he went from largest oil company in the world to arguably the, the smallest, but the coolest <laughs> one we always, we always joke to him. Uh, and then uh, more recently also uh, David Samat, who was uh, at Maersk uh, heading up all the biofuel projects uh, over there. Uh, and besides these, these four, we have another eight uh, excellent uh, team members. Uh, unfortunately, time will not permit me to explain their roles. Uh, if we look at our roadmap, uh, so our objective is to hit 1 million metric tons by, by 2030. Uh, we're on track to uh, close funding, uh, the funding round to construct a one kiloton uh, demo plant in Geleen, which is in the south uh, of the Netherlands. Uh, in parallel, we'll also be developing a 100 kiloton commercial scale plant. This will be in a major port uh, area. And beyond that, uh, we'll switch to a licensing uh, model uh, because we don't believe uh, we can uh, conquer the world uh, by ourselves. Uh, so uh, we'll be licensing the technology to other parts of the world. Uh, and if we have 10 licenses sold uh, and these plants are operational, we hit our 1 million metric ton mark by 2030. Uh, this is my uh, final slide. If we look at our uh, past, present and future, uh, we. I think the, the first startup also was founded in 2017. We were also founded in 2017. We've since raised about uh, 2 million euros, mostly non-dilutive, so mostly EU grants. Uh, and with this money, we realized the operational pilot plant last year and also arranged for offtake agreements uh, for the output of our one kiloton demo plant uh, that I just referenced uh, on the previous slide. For this, uh, we're currently uh, full uh, full mode in the series a which means we have to raise approximately 4 million euros uh, to start construction on our one kiloton demo plant uh, as i mentioned before in parallel we'll also be developing uh, a far larger commercial scale plant using the same technology in a major port uh, this will be a far larger series b round uh, so this time next year be uh, with my hat uh, taking in donations, hopefully 50 million worth of donations uh, to, to construct this plant. Uh, and beyond 2023, after uh, we did these two funding rounds and built a demo and commercial scale plant, uh, we foresee uh, that we can further grow uh, organically, so without raising new equity uh, and be on track to hit our million ton mark by 2030. And with that, uh, I'd like to conclude. And I think now we'll, we'll switch to the question, uh, the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. And uh, indeed, I, I visited a refinery a few years ago and they said, well, we can um, tackle the most dirty, difficult stuff <laughs> that's, that's available on earth. So we should be able to, to tackle biomass at least. Uh, so it's a very good thing that you're working on that, uh, that kind of solution. 
Um, as Michael said, it's now time for q and A. I see that there are some questions in the chat. Um, let's first uh, uh, tackle those, but please keep adding the uh, questions to the chat if they're there. There are not that many yet. Um, so, uh, but let's go to the first uh, question. Um, and that is for uh, Adriano. Um, and it's, it's focused on the, the challenges uh, with material used in the construction of greenhouses. Um, as with such long-term solutions may require disciplined maintenance, etc. So what is uh, uh, the issue there? Are there issues there? Um, well, I mean, greenhouse farms have a lifetime of uh, 20, 25 years. Uh, they're either made out of plastic or uh, um, glass. Uh, in case of plastic, you will have to replace the plastic every three to five years. In case of glass, uh, uh, potentially never. Uh, and it will last even much more than 20, 25 years. It will last uh, kind of forever. Um, the thing is, um, it, 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 you, you, it breaks, uh, let's say this, this, uh, these glasses sometimes break, so they have to replace it. But I don't see uh, much of an issue there. Our system has a lifetime of, as, as all this type of solar thermal based um, collectors, they have a lifetime of 20, 25 years, um, which is more than enough to repay, repay the system. They, we work with a payback time of four to, to eight years, depending on where the facility is uh, placed. Okay, thanks a lot. There's another question for you. Uh, let's tackle that immediately. Um, are, do you have plans to, to move your business to South Africa, uh, South America, for instance, Brazil, that mm -hmm. region? Yeah, so at the moment we are, we, are a small, we are a small team, so we are mainly focusing on south of Europe, uh, North Africa and the Middle East, because those are, let's say, the closest uh, Sunbelt regions uh, to us. Uh, we have seen, we have talked already with uh, some companies in Mexico and in uh, Colombia. Um, it's definitely an interesting market at a certain point. We haven't, uh, and... Um, and California as well, more in the north. Uh, but we haven't um, really started uh, focusing on those because um, we don't have the capacity, to be honest. But uh, it's it's definitely an interesting market, yeah. Okay, great. Um, then a question for uh, William. Um, are there any um, issues uh, related to the robustness of the system and the dynamic nature of real life uh, as model may have limitations. So how does it work out in real life, I guess? Yeah, absolutely. So I think indeed a model is always oversimplified. So what we do in the, the feasibility check, we call it, uh, when we model the building, that's sort of the starting point. But then as soon as the smart skin is live in the building, it's also has a, let's say, over-engineered high type of resolution. So all separate windows have sensors and technology inside so that if one fails or if there's indeed a sort of limitation on, on a certain window that the rest can compensate for it. And the algorithms are active. So it's sort of on a, the, a real time basis where the smart skin adjusts to the surroundings. So we have, for instance, uh, one of our office buildings, which is just commissioned for uh, Dura Vermeer, which is a big contractor. There you saw that uh, a tree was giving shade to a meeting room. And then you see the blinds go down as the sun goes over. Uh, so it's sort of an active responding way. And with that, we hope to account for as many yeah, limitations of a model uh, by yeah having a real time system in place, but it's it's the robustness is definitely a challenge always. I agree. Uh, okay, thanks. I see that you abide by the Trios Energetica yourself because you are wearing a very warm sweater, so that's yes. saving energy, which is good. I should have done that myself, but uh... we uh, 
we renovated a very old farmhouse and made it sustainable. So it's uh, <laughs> so it's cold. It's sometimes a bit cold. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, and for Michael, the the question is, uh, what's your conversion percentage of dry mass as compared to liquid? And I, I may add also on an energy scale. So what is the dry mass energy um, amount and uh, what what percentage of that do you convert? It's about uh, fifty percent by mass. So uh, if we look at sawdust, uh, for instance, it's 50% cellulose, 25% hemicellulose and 25% lignin. Uh, during this coffee making, uh, the hemicellulose breaks down to C5, uh, to, to sugars, uh, which also go into the coffee uh, and into the liquid phase together with the lignin. So this is 50% and then the other 50% cellulose, uh, that's by mass. Uh, if we look at energy, uh, the the highest energy density in, in biomass, uh, apart from oils, uh, natural oils, is found in, in lignin. Uh, and as all the lignin goes uh, to our product, it's about 60%, 60 of the energy content of biomass going into the, the oil product. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, I actually have a question. There, there are a lot of more questions now. We can't tackle them all. Um, but I had a question on the process, actually, of being a startup. Uh, Willem said it's a messy business, actually. And, and could you tell us, all of you or, or one or three of you, what has been your, the most important things you have done that, that were decisive on the success you, you are currently having? And maybe also on the, the big mistake you said. We, we shouldn't have done that. Who wants to uh, go into that question? I don't mind starting. Okay. Uh, I, I've been uh, the first company I founded uh, back in 2009. Uh, I made a lot of mistakes. Uh, and uh, two main mistakes that I that made was bootstrapping too long, which means not taking in investors or postponing that as long as possible because uh, then we'll dilute as founders. Uh, which, which basically just means that the, the time to market increases because you can't really ramp up or scale up. Uh, and another one related to that is uh, focus. Uh, uh, as, as entrepreneurs and uh, especially tech entrepreneurs, we much rather work on inv parallel inventions at, at the same time. And then every day a new invention, it's a lot more fun than bringing the first one uh, to market. Um, and if you don't have venture capital in your company, uh, no one is forcing to put the, the, the blinds on you. Huh? So you, you'll be sucked uh, into, this, uh, into this ever more inventions trap, uh, which is a second reason, apart from speed, uh, that, that I prefer to bring in venture capital into our company early on. In fact, the company was founded in May 2017. And in September 2017, we signed a term sheet with two venture capital firms. Uh, and then we diluted relatively uh, speaking a lot, uh, um, but uh, we've accelerated at an unparalleled pace if we look at other uh, sustainable oil projects uh, mm -hmm. and okay. we're forced to focus. Thanks. Yeah, it's, uh, I recognize that I worked at a, at a government uh, institute that, that also provided subsidies to innovations and sometimes those subsidies were forcing to the, the entrepreneurs to stay in the lower tier, TRL levels, actually. So it's the valley of death you, you move into later. So that's, uh, I recognize this, and, and the real entrepreneur moves ahead anyway. Yeah, subsidies other... are like the, the sirens of Odysseus. Huh? So you're, you're lured to the island and you, and you never leave. Yeah, it's right. Infinitely easier to get a subsidy than a customer. Yeah, <laughs> right. Okay, any other uh, thoughts on that, Adriana or Willem? Yeah, I think, I think I and we can very much relate to it. So maybe to add on the same uh, lesson is one big one for us is indeed also the tendency to over-engineer before engaging with your customer or future customer. So that's something we really learned after developing our first product, which then broke down as, as I showed in the picture. 
from that point onwards, we started to yeah, really develop in connection and in discussion with the client. And it turned out it allowed us to move a lot faster because it helps you focus on the right problems you're solving or on the right value you are aiming to add. Um, yeah, so I very much underline the, the focus and parallel developments uh, as, as a pitfall, at least uh, for engineers or founders. Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, and it, I, I do see similarities with us. So um, it's uh, definitely true that, especially at least for us, when you don't have, I mean, it was our first, it, this is our first, uh, let's say, real company before we had the technical consulting business that is, uh, say, a bit of a different uh, type of business where you simply write a report for a client and then you don't have a responsibility about it. Here you are developing something, you're looking for clients. And it's definitely true, at least for us, that at the beginning, you're scared of, of sharing information. You, you don't have enough experience to understand what, what, is, what is that you have to keep secret, what is that you can open. And this some, often or, or sometimes lead to delays in, uh, in what you're doing. And, uh, uh, and so, like, we like, for example, we founded the company in 2017. And only this year, we really started looking for VC capital in, in a serious way after, let's say, took us uh, two years and a half to develop the technology, but also to be, build up the confidence to get, let's say, a, a VC involved uh, into, into the business. And uh, I guess maybe at a certain point uh, in the future, I will look, I will look at it as a, as a mistake, you know. <laughs> because uh, maybe it, it could have been faster, but okay, I mean, it's part of the game. Yeah. Okay. And there was this uh, a good idea of Willem, I guess, uh, to, for Ariano and Willem to join forces in using the, uh, the Willem's technology also in greenhouses. I think there's a potential there. Uh, it sounds good. I didn't know about this development at uh, FISA, so yeah. absolutely. But, I'm... But, I'm uh, Definitely uh, willing to further discuss uh, possibilities of collaboration. But please keep in mind what Michael just said, <laughs> stick to your product and make it. Exactly. Sell, exactly. sell it. Uh, this is just a new idea. But yeah. there's a lot of opportunity there. Well, okay, I think it's, it's time now. Um, I thought it was very interesting and it's a, really a pity. We have a lot of questions now which are interesting. I don't know, Peter, uh, what we can do with those. They're, probably going to be uh, saved and can be shared with you. But I leave that to Peter, what we're going to do with those. But thanks for all the questions, but especially thanks to, uh, to you three. Uh, really very interesting. Um, we're going to um, reconvene in, uh, what is it? I have to check that. In um, 10 minutes, I believe. Yeah. Uh, or 50 minutes now. We have a 50 minutes break and then I hope to uh, see all of you or at least you will see me again. Uh, together with Diederik, I see he's also uh, joined us already um, uh, for to go on with this uh, meeting. Thank you very much for now and uh, see you later.